first thing that would in essence have to be done. The second particular aspect after that would then be dealing with the long-term strategic plans situations of the organization and then followed by what tasks um, they have to accomplish, how one should be organized effectively, and then in essence deal with the rest of the subsystems, uh, that is uh, the organizational structure, the information system, the technological system, and so on and the like. But the first, the group dynamics of senior management, and then the second to be the strategic uh, plan and intent of the organization. There have been patterns that have been followed, and they're almost getting to be recipes right now for how you implement organizational change. And I think they were also talked about in a previous conference, maybe about a year or so ago, when we talked about TQM. Really, uh, we have to get senior management involved. We have to, first of all, create an awareness for them. They have to understand the process that's on the table. There has to be commitment. And all these steps have to be performed. They don't take long to do. That really, possibly over a month or two. And then we come back and say, you understand what's going on. Let's go ahead and implement it. Then we have to have a rollout plan. We have to have a steering committee. You know, and then we have to implement education. And then we have to get teams started and do some of the technical training. But all of these things are pretty much the pattern that our companies are following here in organizational change. As far as this new discipline is concerned, the fifth discipline, let's say, that really to me is another uh, possibility. It's part of the body of knowledge. It improves things. And that would be incorporated and integrated into this whole change process. Thank you, gentlemen. Before we continue with Module 2, we would like to congratulate, in, in, on behalf of International Training Center, we would like to congratulate the International Commission of Mexico for their um, convention and their big meeting that is uh, taking place right now in Mexico. Uh, and now we're continuing with Module number 2, where Mr. Wolf will explain to us the rest of his talk. Thank you. Technological breakthroughs in telecommunications, transportation, and decision support tools have fundamentally changed the way we do business. These changes have resulted in global competition, which is revising the economic order of nations. Let's look at the current situation. As individuals and organizations, we need to decide whether or not we are going to evolve or drift toward mediocrity and eventual extinction. As de described in Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, The Arts and Practice of the Learning Organization, one-third of the firms that made the 1970 Fortune 500 list had vanished by 1983. Considering this 33% corporate mortality rate, it also raises questions regarding the vitality of the remaining corporations in this group. The remaining corporations, unable to keep up with the increasing rate of change, may well have spiraled downward toward mediocrity. The organization, organizational changes now required in our current fast-changing business environment are no longer surface or cosmetic changes. They go to the very structure of the organization, its policies and its people. What organizational changes are now required? The changes now required include changes to our traditional organizational structures. Traditional hierarchical structures are no longer necessary in this information age, nor are they desirable. They thwart the creative thinking of the organization's members, resulting in a system that cannot quickly respond to dynamic changes. There are changes required in how we work. Most of the work in our organizations is done in processes. We are entering into the next century with processes designed in the 60s that do not take advantage of current technology or thinking. Creative thinking is required, re-engineering, to basically change and streamline these processes. This creative thinking involves rethinking of what we are trying to accomplish, unencumbered by current approaches. It involves taking advantage of new computer and telecommunication technologies. At a more detailed level, the major element to consider in a process is the people, the work that they do and how this work is organized. At this level, job descriptions must be changed to reflect workers' desires for a sense of achievement and for creativity. There has to be changes in managers' roles and responsibilities. To affect these changes in structure, in processes, and in people, 
the role of the manager must change. Managers must become coaches and support the creativity of their associates. They are responsible for creating and providing an internal environment that encourages and supports people who want to increase their personal mastery. There must be changes in the roles and responsibilities also of workers. Fundamental changes are also required in our business associates called workers. Workers in our new organizations must think holistically. In essence, they must become business people. They must have the skills and the training to speak up and to contribute effectively to resolving both strategic issues and operational problems. Assimilation of these new technologies, skills and roles requires a modification of thinking patterns and attitudes. As decisions are pushed to lower levels of the organization, we must learn how to engage in meaningful dialogue without rancor or archaic attitudes. We must learn how to play down advocacy and learn the art of inquiry to arrive as a team at the most effective solutions which will be supported by all. Everybody must re be re-equipped to operate in a new information age with the internet where teams will see no national boundaries and the use of chat groups to solve business problems will be common. To make this transition, as we have learned in the TQM process, requires a total commitment by the organization. The company workforce must be mobilized and aligned to a common vision. We must build a community of common purpose. Unfortunately, the changes required must be assimilated on a company-by-company -company basis. Each company is responsible for its organizational development to meet the challenges ahead. Rules, results are predictable for those companies that fail to provide programs for organizational improvement. Investment in this area must now be made to ensure the future success of the company. As a result of Peter Senge's book, we see more clearly methods of improving organizational development process. We also see the depth and intensity of the changes required which are affecting our world and which will offer opportunities to our organizations not visualized a few years ago. As an example, consideration is being given to substituting the word community for the word corporation. Community more accurately expresses the desired state of a learning organization. Are we ready? As the TQM body of knowledge has grown, what have we learned? With the ever-growing TQM body of knowledge, we have learned through the trial and error process how to effectively approach organizational change. Thousands of companies in various nations have used the team approach to plan and coordinate the implementation of the TQM process in their companies. These are the implementation steps currently in use. For example, after an initial senior management training and commitment phase, a TQM steering committee is formed. This empowered team is responsible for guiding the company implementation process. Roles and responsibilities of the steering committee members are assigned. A multi-year rollout program is formulated. It is updated periodically. Issues regarding company structural changes and policy changes are quickly resolved by this empowered steering committee with the CEO an active participant. Company vision and mission statements are formulated and approved having as their focus the delighted customer. Major opportunities for improvement are identified based upon cost of quality or other techniques. To increase skill levels, training programs are provided for the critical mass in problem solving, teaming, communication, etc. Teams are established and supported. Personnel policies such as reward and recognition systems are updated to nurture the people responsible for creating these improved conditions. Finally, we must be patient and persistent. Most medium-sized, above 100 employee American companies are aware of the TQM process and either have programs underway or will be starting them as a result of competition or demands by their customers. In a recent development, most California State University schools of business now require graduates to have an understanding of TQM philosophies and techniques. 
These new managers of the 90s will have a basic understanding of this new philosophy of management. Now, what can we do to improve our methods of, of instituting organizational change and becoming learning organizations? In the two books cited, The Fifth Discipline and The Fifth Discipline Field Book by Peter Sange and others, have provided a new body of knowledge which fleshes out and augments the implementation techniques of TQM. It provides solutions to situations which have hampered existing change processes and resulted in only marginally effective solutions. Learning disciplines place more emphasis on the growth of the individuals and the organization, whereas TQM leans heavily on technical considerations. For example, statistical process controls, just-in-time techniques, single-moment exchange of dyes, Kanban, etc. The new body of knowledge described as the five learning disciplines provides new avenues to improve the teaming process, to get people involved through personal mastery and sharing the vision. It also provides powerful new insights for process improvement using archetypes and understanding dynamic change environment, where one cannot always learn based upon experience. The approaches to dealing with mental models is a discipline which should be understood by all involved in changing organizations. An inability to deal with mental models has stymied improvements in many corporations. However, the way employees have been taught to think and to interact create fundamental learning disabilities. Learning disabilities are tragic to children when they are allowed to go undetected. They are also tragic to organizations where they also largely go undetected. Let's look at the seven organizational learning disabilities. Number one, I am my position. We confuse our own identities with our jobs. I am a machine operator, not I am George Wolfe. As an example, when training was offered to workers in industries being downsized, many workers suffered an acute identity crisis. How could I possibly do anything else other than what I have done the last past 20 to 30 years? When people in an organization focus only on their position, they feel little sense of responsibility for the results produced when persons interact. They are not thinking basically about the organization. If the results of a company efforts are disappointing, someone else in the organization screwed up. Number two, the enemy is out there. When things go wrong, someone else is to blame. In many corporations, this has been elevated to a commandment. Thou shalt always find an external agent to blame. This learning deficiency is actually a byproduct of the I am my position syndrome, which fosters a fragmented way of looking at a connected world. Number three, the illusion of taking charge. Being proactive is popular among managers. Managers will take aggressive actions against an external enemy to solve problems before they grow into a crisis. All too often, Proactiveness is reactiveness in disguise. If we simply become more aggressive, fighting the enemy out there, we are reacting. True proactiveness comes from understanding how we contribute to our own problems. It is a product of our way of thinking, not our emotional state. The number four learning disability is being focused on events instead of patterns or processes which cause these events to take place. We are conditioned to see life as a series of events. For every event, there must be a justifiable cause, which we are trained to focus on. This short-term focus distracts us from understanding the underlying causes of these patterns. The fixation results from our evolutionary programming and is supported by the event reporting in the, of the television media. Number five, the inability to adapt to gradual changes. Existing processes in our company often prevents us from understanding slowly emerging patterns which might threaten our existence 
or significant opportunities also which are developing. When was the last time your organization rewarded someone for raising difficult questions about current company policies? Companies reward people who excel in advocating their views, not inquiring into complex issues. Company teams are incredib incredibly proficient in keeping themselves from learning. The number six learning discipline is learning from experience. The core dilemma that confronts organizations is that while we learn best from experience, we never directly experience the consequences of many of our important decisions. The results of these decisions are removed from us by time and by distance. We often do not see the effects on other departments which result from these, these decisions which we have made. The seventh learning discipline is the inability of the senior management team to resolve complex issues. All too often management teams spend their time fighting turf wars. They tend to avoid issues which would make them look bad personally. They would rather maintain the appearance of a cohesive team. The team works well on routine issues. When they confront complex issues that are embarrassing or threatening, teamness collapses. A mastery of the five learning disciplines should be gained by all those involved in culturally changing the organization. The learning organization raises the standard of companies seeking perfection in their operations. The learning organization becomes more responsive to change. They have developed the ability to create their own future. As my colleague Dr. Chaudron explained, knowledge and use of the five learning disciplines by key individuals in your company will provide a significant improvement in the effectiveness of your TQM process. The knowledge will also assist your key individuals in selecting the appropriate intervention programs to keep your improvement programs moving ahead. How can we use the five learning disciplines to enhance current organizational change efforts? How can we use the ideas in the five learning disciplines to overcome the seven organizational learning disabilities we have discussed? How can we integrate these concepts in an existing TQM rollout plan? We must first of all ensure that the key players in your organization change process understand and practice the five learning disciplines. These key players in the TQM or other organizational change process are normally organized into teams. These teams would benefit from training in the five learning disciplines. Team one, for example, includes the CEO and those people who report directly to him or her. Team two includes those assigned to the TQM steering committee who plan and coordinate the company change process. People in the company arbitrarily chosen because of their genuine interest and the success of the company are organized into Team 3. Team 4 consists of key members of existing company improvement teams who are chosen for the purpose of helping to improve the quality of their team efforts. The above four teams could then be combined to form two training groups of approximately 12 to 25 people in each. Teams 1 and 2 would form one group, while Teams 3 and 4 would form the second group. A customized curricula is then selected for each group from the five learning disciplines, described in the fifth discipline field book. The curricular proposal will then be developed by a senior management who is serving on the TQM steering committee and a senior human relations person. These individuals are chartered with providing answers as to how the learning organization is to be developed. Books must be read, seminars must be attended, Training proposals from various organizations must be obtained and screened. After consultation with all affected associates, a detailed training proposal is submitted, tailored to the needs of the organization. Trainers may be contracted for, say, six-month periods for a schedule compatible with training effectiveness and company schedules. Training would be primarily in a workshop mode to give people practice with the concepts presented. The workshop topics would be designed around company issues and company processes to ensure credibility of the training. Scenarios are suggested to dramatically portray 
before and after situations and to provide some humor. The training proposal will delineate the outcomes expected and how these outcomes would be measured after the training program is completed. The training program may be presented in one or two day formats, once a month to the two initial groups involved. These would expose these groups to each of the five learning disciplines and would give them the opportunity to develop their skills. Appropriate workshop exercises for each learning discipline module may be found in the fifth discipline field book. Regarding the sequence of presentation of the five learning discipline modules in the proposed training program, shared vision and personal mastery are usually presented first with team learning and mental models a natural next step. The fifth learning discipline, system thinking, builds upon the first four disciplines and is offered next. The fifth discipline, systems thinking, represents a more effective way of thinking and acting about the systems and processes which we are involved in. It integrates the previous four learning disciplines. Without a systematic orientation, there is no motivation to understand how the previous four disciplines are integrated. Systems thinking, in turn, needs the learning disciplines of building a shared vision, team learning, personal mastery, and mental models to realize its potential. System thinking involves new laws. Let's look at some examples. One, today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. A current example, quarterly car sales are off to the previous quarter's aggressive rebate program. Number two, the harder you push, the harder the system pushes back. An example is low-income housing, the 1960s versus the 1970s. Despite the massive efforts to improve in the 60s, the situation became worse in the big cities in the 70s as people migrated to take advantage of the low-income housing that had now become available. The system pushes back. Number three, behavior grows better as it grows worse. Compensating feedback involves a time delay between the short-term benefit and the long-term disadvantages. Number four, cause and effect are not necessarily related in time and space. Small ch number five, small changes can produce big results, but they are often less obvious. And number six, there is no blame, only relationships. And number seven, we must remember, you are part of a single system. The fifth discipline is the conceptual cornerstone of how the members of a learning organization think about their world. The 50-year-long American-Soviet arms race is an example of the need for systems thinking. We built arms which were perceived by the Soviets as a threat to their country. In turn, they built arms. This resulted in our response to build more arms. This system drained the U.S. economy and devastated the Soviet economy. It terrified two generations of the world's citizens. The long-term results of each side desire to be more secure heightened the insecurity of all. Again, doing the obvious thing did produce the desired outcome. With all the supposed tools for dealing with complex issues, why could we not have escaped this 50-year arms race? The arms race demonstrates a generic pattern of escalation. No different than the turf warfare between two gangs or the advertising battle between two consumer good companies fighting for market share. System thinking helps us to see patterns lying behind the events. The current system tools can handle detailed complexity. However, the current system tools cannot handle dynamic complexity. These are situations where cause and effect are subtle and where the obvious intervention can produce non-obvious results because of time delays and interactions. These complex dynamics frequently occur in modern enterprises where days are required to produce something, months to hire people, and years to develop new products, nurture management talent, and build a reputation for quality. During these varying time delays, 
All of these processes interact continually. The real leverage of system thinking lies in understanding this dynamic complexity. The fifth discipline calls for a shift of mind and understanding of reality. Using the various system archetypes presented in Senge's book, which shows circular interrelationships with time delays and side effects, one can begin to comprehend the most effective moves to make. As an example of circular relationships and archetypes, take for an example archetype number one. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Whoever makes the most noise gets the most attention. Now imagine someone who knows nothing about mechanics and who wants to grab oil. However, he mistakenly picks up a can of water. He splashes it on the squeaky wheel. With great relief, he hears the squeaking stop. After a brief time, the squeak returns more loudly. As the air, the heat build up and the water cause the joint to rust. Once again, he rushes to fix the problem, reaching for the can of water. After all, it worked the last time. Eventually, over time, the wheel starts, stops squeaking permanently. It is now encased in rust. Suppose the squeaking wheel is a customer, squeaking for a shipment that is two weeks late. How do you know we are applying oil or water when we respond? In our frenzy to stop the irritation, are we applying oil to the flames or applying water to the rust? Have we thought out the consequences that will occur over time? The central theme of Archetype 1 is that any de decision carries both long-term and short-term consequences. These two consequences are often diametrically opposed. As shown on your screen and in the appendix of your participant manual, the problem symptom at the top of the diagram cries out for resolution. A solution is implemented which alleviates this symptom. However, the unintended consequences of the fix actually worsen the performance of what we are attempting to correct. Often people are aware of the negative consequences of the quick fix. They do it anyway. The pain of not doing something right away is more urgent and more powerful than the delayed negative effects of the decision. The decision by Thiokol many years ago to launch the Challenger shuttle based upon pressure by NASA is an example of the, this type of event. Sure, the relief is temporary. However, the symptom returns, often worse than before. This happens because the unintended consequences in the bottom reinforcing loop of the diagram continue to grow slowly over a long period of time. They go unnoticed at first. They continue to accumulate as the wrong solution is repeatedly applied until failure occurs. Many business problems which have occurred in the past have been explained using the various systems, archetypes, shown in Peter Senge's seminal book, The Fifth Discipline, which was published in 1990. Training your key employees in the five learning disciplines will improve company performance, help improve synergetic communications, and quality decision making. It enhances the efforts of companies currently involved in a structured TQM process. Organizations seriously committed to total quality management are uniquely equipped to study the five learning disciplines. For those companies that for various reasons are not involved in TQM, it offers an attractive starting point for organizational development. In summarizing, Learning organizations will have a competitive advantage in the increasingly complex environments we face in the years ahead. Systems thinking is the integrating force for organizations to move successfully into the future. To implement this approach at all levels, a community of people having a shared interest must be developed. The manager's role is to provide the right environment. This requires employees who must learn to act in the best interests of the company, who learn about the total business as well as their own tasks. Without this knowledge, employees are unable to make the contributions to the company that they are capable of making. Developing skills in systems thinking leads to significant breakthroughs in the design of systems, which must operate in the dynamic change environments ahead. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Let's begin the second question and answer session. We want to remind you that there are some materials in Spanish about this topic. One of them is the title that Armando is just mentioning, like Aplicaciones de la Ingeniería de Sistemas, Métodos y Resultados. That's uh, authored by Dr. Cardenas, the director of the International Training Center. These have been published by Editorial Limusa Publishing House from Mexico. Now we have questions coming from via fax and via phone. One is coming from Argentina from the University Blas Pascal in Cordoba, Argentina. How can or do managers create the time for learning? Let's take a look at the present world. We talked about the need for more response, the fact that you have to interact on um, many more issues as managers. If we continue this, the present process, we can develop heroic managers. They're busy all the time. Really, for to answer this kind of a question, we have to, as managers, set the example. If we are constantly doing busy, busy work with a thesis, you know, like the chain gang, the chain gang will move as fast as I move, we have to change our thinking, basically. And what we're talking about is offloading, empowering other people to do the work, and then taking time to, to do reflection on what can we do to, to, to develop a learning organization instead of just doing busy work all day long. I think that on the other hand is that managers are going to have to realize that in any organizational change, any organizational change at all, there are going to be some short-term negative consequences. And as a result of that, you're going to have to be willing to suffer for a little while um, in the short term so that you can gain something in the long term. And there's no way around it that I know of. Muchas gracias. And now we have, uh, we're going back to Brazil, who has a question for us coming via fax. What positive and negative examples do you have of changes in mo mental models in environments that change very rapidly, such as software uh, for computers, biotechnology, and telecommunications fields? I think that as far as there are a number, in there, I think that there are a number of una serie I'm sorry, I think that there are a number of different alternatives as far as successes are concerned. I think that um, the beginning, in essence, as far as AT&T, in terms of their beginning to become a learning organization, and in essence, I think the variety of examples, both in the software industry and the electronics industry in, in the U.S., that are, are relatively successful in terms of how they have to deal with this. Um, the measure of success is not a change in the mental model, but frankly, in terms of their surviving. <laughs> um, and I think that as far as bad examples are concerned, roughly to 70 to 80 percent of those organizations that implement these kind of projects fail. And so I think there are a variety of, of, of uh, failures, in essence, that you can see around you at any, at any particular time. So, I agree with what was said, yeah. La siguiente pregunta nos viene de... Next question is coming from the University from Baja California Sur, La Paz University, Autonomous University. Buenas, good afternoon. The question is, are there any experiences to your knowledge that have applied the fifth discipline in educational models? Uh, yes, I think what we're doing at Cal State Long Beach or applies it. Um, in in most colleges, we have collegiality. That is, instructors and professors talk together and so forth. So it's a pretty open organization. So uh, we're trying to make changes there. So we're applying some of the disciplines of mental models and systems thinking in that application. I think, I think those are, uh, are good examples. That's fine. Now we have another question from Pemex, Tabasco, Mexico. We have two questions. First question, in the process of change to, towards applying total quality management, to what extent do you think it's important to apply the control procedures? And the second question is, how can we synchronize re-engineering with TQM? Thank you. <laughs> 